Okay, welcome to our very first Google Hangout to celebrate World Ocean Week. Today we're talking about sustainable seafood, making smart choices at the market. Let's meet our experts from ISSF and Blue Marine Foundation, Charles Clover and Mike Crispino. Hi everybody, so I'm going to make some introductions. I'm Samantha from the Taramar Project and here's Charles Clover. Charles, please introduce yourself. I will say for those of you who have not seen End of the Line, I highly, highly recommend it. It's available on Netflix, which I don't know if it's in the UK, but it is in the US. And you can get the DVD or check out the website. It's a film that definitely changed my perspective on the choices I make in fish I eat and opened my eyes to a lot of issues as it relates to fishing and sustainable seafood purchases at the market. And now I will introduce Mike Christina. It's going to be on Netflix in UK and a whole raft of other places uh, within a month or so, but it, it already is in the US. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. I will include links to see the trailer for that film as well as ways in which you can watch it yourself after our hangout. And now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Mike Crispino from ISSF. Hi, Mike. Hello, Samantha. Hello, Charles. It's good to meet you virtually. Um, uh, I used to be a U.S. television news journalist, uh, unlike Charles, not as high profile and was not focused on the environment either, but did move to the environment and moved to tuna sustainability um, through the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation, which is uh, where I currently work, ISSF for short. There's a lot of acronyms in seafood sustainability because there's so many words, I guess, to be used. Um, ISSF focuses on the health of tuna stocks, the tuna stocks, um, the 19 tuna stocks that support uh, commercially fished tuna, uh, which are basically, if, uh, for lack of uh, better reference, canned or uh, pouched tuna that you would buy to make a tuna sandwich or a tuna salad. Uh, we work with WWF uh, and the tuna industry and also the scientific community uh, towards our end game, which is 100% sustainable tuna stocks. Why is tuna sustainability so important, Mike? Um, well, as my earpiece is falling out here, uh, <laughs> uh, tuna sustainability is extremely important. It's one of the most commonly consumed uh, species of seafood out there. It's integral to um, the uh, economies of many coastal nations, particularly in the Pacific Islands region. Um, it's a form of protein that the world needs as the population expands and grows and there's more demand for protein and affordable protein. Uh, tuna is one of those go-to resources. Um, uh, but as we know, there are um, some stocks of tuna and some species of tuna that uh, are not as resilient to the heavy fishing pressure that is put on them. Uh, so there is a need for uh, both industry, the environmental community, governments, uh, and scientists to work together on finding practical solutions uh, that can reduce uh, the fishing effort that is put on these tuna stocks so that they do have long-term viability, so that they can remain uh, a, a resource for uh, not only the coastal developing nations that rely on these resources uh, for their economies, but also all of the uh, hundreds of millions of people that consume tuna each year. There are so many different types of tuna out there. 
yellowfin tuna, skipjack, bluefin tuna. Charles, can you talk to me about the differences in tuna and why some are more endangered than others and why we need to make smart choices when we order sushi or we buy canned tuna at the supermarket? Well, the, the tuna's problem is that it's too delicious. Um, and uh, the temperate water ones, uh, the bluefin, are the most delicious. And um, they tend to fix, fetch the highest prices. And therefore, they tend to be the most overfished. Um, that's simple, really. And um, despite what you may hear from people in the southern hemisphere, where they have a different variety of bluefin, um, there is reason to be worried about that stock, and there's reason to be worried about the northern hemisphere stock. Uh, on the U.S. side of the Atlantic, uh, it's been fished to hell, but it's being managed sustainably. Um, on the Mediterranean side of the Atlantic, it's, um, it's not been fished down that hard, but it's being fished to hell. So, it, you place your money, quite a lot of it, and you get a piece of bluefin tuna about that size. Um, and that's called sushi, uh, or sashimi sometimes. And um, the Japanese pay a lot for that, and increasingly Westerners do too, in terms of price. And so that has driven down the bluefin stock quite a lot. Um, there is another whole range of tunas. Um, there, are, there are hundreds of species of tunas, but in fact the ones that are commercial um, are really the uh, yellowfin and uh, other tropical uh, tunas, the skipjack. These are the skipjack are known as the cockroaches of the sea, because nobody's ever worked out how, how many there are. And they're probably the only fish stock that we haven't overfished yet. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a, there's a full range um, of uh, unsustainability within the commercial tuna catches that you will find in the market. And therefore, there is a point trying to guide consumers towards the ones where they are not yet overfished. Long story. So in general, the average consumer is unaware that there's depletions in fish stocks around our world and our oceans, and they may not necessarily know how to make the smart choices at the supermarket. And they might not even be able to trace where fish they're trying to buy comes from. How do you, how to say Harriet, the mom of three, trying to make healthy choices and purchase seafood for her family for dinner at night, how does she make smart choices at the supermarket? Is that one for me? For either of you. Uh, well, I think it's very difficult with tuna. And it's incredibly difficult to know either by species or by brand whether you're buying the right thing. Because if you're buying the most sustainable tuna, which is Bycatch could be of turtles, more endangered fish, other more endangered tuna, 
uh, Big Eye, for example, uh, and so on. So I don't envy Mike. He's got a damn hard job, and I don't know which children to buy myself. So over to him. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it, it is a challenge, and I think for that very reason, I mean, uh, obviously when consumers go to the grocery store, they're likely not buying a bluefin steak, right, or a can of bluefin tuna, unless you're at a specialty shop in, you know, Rome or something, and you buy a jar of bluefin tuna, but it's not all too common. Like uh, like Charles said, it, it is mainly the skipjack that you're seeing in the canned tuna, although there's yellowfin and big eye mixed in. The yellowfin and big eye are the species that um, uh, grow larger, live longer than skipjack, so uh, obviously skipjack is the more resilient species. Uh, I would say from our, our perspective, you know, the advice that consumers can really take to the grocery store with them is really um, to do some amount of homework. I mean, there is sort of an onus on the consumer population to really kind of, if they care about these issues, they do need to dig into it. And, uh, you know, and while not all um, species of seafood that's available, uh, you know, at the counter or on the grocery shelf uh, may be sustainable today, if it's not sustainable today, you need to be asking the questions, well, what are you doing to uh, bring it into a better state? What is the continuous improvement plan that uh, that fishery or that stock is on to get it to a state where one day it could be certified sustainable. And I think from our perspective, that's certainly something that we're working on is we're working on a holistic approach to these problems that are facing tuna fisheries because like Charles said, you know, it's not just the, the health of a tuna stock. It's, it's the fishing method. It's the number of vessels that are out there. It's the monitoring of those vessels. It's the management of the tuna stocks as a whole and all of these issues and key components to a fishery um, there's no silver bullet that can really, uh, you know, attack it and say, bam, you have a sustainable product. Uh, you need to address all of these individual issues. So it's not easy. So for the consumer, there's an amount of education that they need to do on their own and they need to look around because there are a lot of sources out there. Um, and then, you know, if you cannot find that product that you are convinced is 100% sustainable, which is very hard to find for any species out there, you need to be asking, is the product I'm buying, is the company I'm buying from working towards improving this? Um, and as an organization, we don't really tell consumers what they should or should not buy, uh, but certainly there are some aspects of, uh, of the tuna industry that you want to make sure um, your um, brand or the company you're buying from is taking part in, uh, and if they're not working to address these roadblocks that are standing in the way of tuna right now, uh, then that's something you probably should consider if this is a concern. Unfortunately, as I think Charles would be able to tell you as well, many consumers aren't paying attention to it and they're not educating themselves and they're not demanding better practices, so it will move slower. And of course, that can be segmented by geography and, you know, Northern Europe and in places like the UK, there's a lot more of an emphasis on seafood sustainability, but there are many regions of the world you go to um, and it's simply just not there. You know, we would like to make an effort to share more information through the Taramar Project and through our social media channels about how you can make smart choices. And I wonder if it's maybe because people can't relate to what happens in the ocean because it's so vast and they don't see it, they don't taste it, they don't touch it, except maybe when they're on vacation or if people live in coastal areas. Is there a way to relate what's happening in the high seas with overfishing to something that's happening on land? Could you equate, you know, maybe eating bluefin tuna to say eating a cheetah? You know, is it that, you know, endangered to use a better, you know, a different word than, you know, sustainable? How do we relate what's happening in the ocean to what's happening on land and into people's lives? I find that there's a disconnect there and you know, you guys are experts in this field and you have a really great grasp on what's happening. How do we help share this information with more people and connect them to a part of their world that they really need to start caring about more? Charles? Well, I think the, the job's been done. Uh, it's just a matter of communicating it. Um, if you look up the uh, IUCN red list, uh, which is the, um, uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN. 
that's where the international community uh, establishes what is endangered and what is the comparability between terrestrial species and marine ones. And if you look up the panda and you look up bluefin tuna, I think you'll find they're both listed as endangered. So there is some comparability. And it's not that hard to find on the internet. Um, but the understanding, as you say, that a, that a bluefin that is being sold commercially uh, is the same kind of, uh, in the same kind of plight as a panda, um, is not as widely understood. But it's the case. And you wouldn't need a panda. Right. <laughs> you wouldn't need a cheetah. The marine environment is just about a century behind the terrestrial environment in people's concern about it. I mean, people in the 1890s were creating uh, massive game reserves in southern Africa uh, because people trophy hunters and meat hunters had shot all the game. And people were worrying around about the same time about birds of paradise in ladies' hats. But, you know, hey, we're, we're only just worrying about bluefin tuna. But we started worrying about it. We started worrying about it about 15 years ago. We got more worried about it. And the worrying is actually having a positive effect because the rampant overfishing of the bluefin um, in the East Atlantic anyway, I think they dealt with that in the West Atlantic, has come down. The quotas allocated by politicians are roughly in line with what scientific advice now is. And uh, that's got to be a good thing. It was about six times more than that. Uh, at one point, half of it illegality and the other half of it just politicians giving too much quota. So concern has already had an effect for the bluefin and it could get better. So I personally wouldn't eat it because I wouldn't want to eat anything on the IUCN red list. And if you're in the habit of eating something regularly, I would check out whether what the OED is on there. <laughs> but, you know, there are things at the other end of the tuna spectrum. Uh, the skipjack things that we were talking about that can be eaten with a pretty clear conscience as long as you can assure yourself that they're not being caught with anything else. Well, the way of doing that is by buying the tins which say pole and line caught. Not long line, that's, that could be 80 miles long, but pole and line. That means one fisherman, one pole, one fish. No turtles. So that's what I buy. And, and just to pick up on Charles' point there, because I think it's very interesting, particularly in the UK where the switch to pole and line has been um, so major and so public. It's been something the public has been uh, very interested and involved in. Um, but I would say that, uh, you know, just to challenge uh, shoppers out there and consumers out there, selectivity is not the only measure of sustainability, right? I mean, uh, as Charles said, the skipjack 
is a robust fecund species. So, you know, by all means, if there is one tuna species to eat, it is likely that. Um, but, uh, you know, different fishing methods have their different issues. And uh, there's also the verification of how do you know that what you think you're getting is what you're getting. So there are holistic improvements to industry that just must be made, whether you are fishing with a line, whether you are fishing with a net, whether you are buying something with a label on it, or whether you're not. There are improvements that all of industry must make uh, in order for consumers to feel more confident that what they are getting is in fact what it says that it is um, on the can like Charles said because you want to know that especially in instances where you're paying a premium for that product that that premium is going um, for the uh, purposes that uh, you desire in purchasing the product. So it sounds like a few simple things people can do is to look on the can itself and see what it says, especially in the UK. It seems that that information is readily available. You know, possibly check the IUCN red list. Make sure you're not eating anything that's terribly endangered. If you see bluefin tuna on a sushi menu or at a Japanese restaurant, make a choice not to eat it. That isn't a choice you should be making. And I know in the US, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has a pretty good seafood watch list. And in the UK, um, Fish to Fork, which is a part of Blue Marine Foundation, is a great resource as well. This is all, these are links that I can provide after our hangout and send out to people so they can start educating themselves about smart choices to make at the supermarket. I know we've been focusing. One more. Sure, tell me. There's one more. Uh, in UK and uh, Europe, the, the actual source list for uh, the, the, the seafood guide, the same kind of seafood guide as Monterey Bay Aquarium, is the UK Marine Conservation Society. Now, Blue Marine Foundation bases its restaurant guide on that guide, the, on the, the uh, Marine Conservation Society, Fish Online. And uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to claim that Blue Marine Foundation had invented anything as brilliant as Fish Online. I would recommend people get straight there. And to go to Fish to Fork for for restaurant sustainability. And I would even say that there's one more thing. It's not a guide, um, and it's not just one thing, but I think picking up a book, watching a documentary like The End of the Line, visiting some web pages, uh, seeking out that um, uh, that uh, knowledge that is out there from all sorts of groups, from you know the World Wildlife Fund to groups like Charles's, um, to groups like ours even at ISSF, I think seeking out information, I think uh, consumers need to have an appetite for that. Not just to know what it is that they should choose, but know what it is that they should choose and why they're choosing it. I think that's a very important thing for just people to read more and watch more documentaries and ask more questions and by all means at the government level too. This this is largely a government issue in that governments manage these fisheries and they're supposed to be acting on our behalf. So there are a lot of aspects to this um, that's just unfortunately not as simple as pulling out um, a wallet card, while those can be very handy. Um, I would encourage people to start reading more and start watching more and getting more engaged. Mike, I think those are all great points, and Charles as well. I think, you know, you can be proactive in your life and choices you make. I don't think everybody's going to go out and necessarily sign petitions or reach out to their local governments or their governments in total, which we'd love for you to do to start making changes on a larger scale. But if we can even just encourage people to make small choices and small changes, even if it is just watching a documentary or educating yourself about what's out there, I think that's a really great first step. And then we can encourage you to go to the next level. You know, I think it's not until people are educated about the problem that they'll have the tools they need to take that next step to encourage government to make changes. Um, you know, I appreciate both of you sharing your insight and your um, points of view and your expertise. You know, I know we focused a lot on tuna specifically, but are there other things that people should know about, you know, as it relates to seafood and choices they make at the supermarket outside of tuna? Well, we sure are. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're, we're back to those seafood guys. Uh, because every time you think there's a problem solved, uh, uh, another problem, another gaping hole in, in uh, the alleged sustainability of the seafood industry opens up. Uh, for example, it happened to 
the Europeans with the mackerel. We were all recommending that mackerel was the most sustainable fish. It, it re reproduced really rapidly. There was a heck of a lot of it. And you should eat it because it's very good for you. And then the Icelanders decided to take 150,000 tons more than the total quota taken by everybody else. And so did the Faroese. And the result, anarchy. Uh, all the listings been dropping mackerel. It's been a complete fiasco. So um, I'm afraid we just have to look very closely at the, at the guides we uh, trust. They may be in a, a marine conservation society, they may be uh, on the continent of Europe, they, the North Sea Foundation, the, the, the various other people, uh, like WWF in some countries. Just find the one that works best for your country and keep tracking it. Because buried in there will be a lot of really good information about why that stock's going up or down. Uh, as Mike says, you need to be quite curious to get to the bottom of this. But there is one more thing. I mean, there are brands and retailers who are more trustworthy than others, and I don't mind plugging them. I mean, in the UK, I don't know what it's like in the US, but uh, Walmart has made various undertakings. Mike can do, deal with that. Uh, but in the UK, there are various brands. Uh, for whom you cannot buy a radically unsustainably managed fish. I mean, fish stock. Fish from a radically un a, a, a badly managed stock. Um, I would plug two uh, Waitrose Marks and Spencers. Um, they, they are, I would trust them to, to um, provide sustainable seafood. So there's a brand issue here. Yeah, and I'm not going to specifically plug any uh, grocers or brands, but I would say um, that you know the first step it, to recognizing whether or not that is a brand you can trust is do they have a policy? In this day and age, having a policy on sustainable seafood is a uh, cost of doing business. It is something you must do. Um, and if there is no sustainable seafood policy in place, I think that's probably your first sign. But uh, most people are at least getting to that step. And that's not necessarily saying having a policy is enough. It's then acting upon a policy. But, um, but that, that, that's certainly a first step uh, um, you know, when you're looking to see uh, where to place your trust. That's great information. I don't want to take up too much more of um, both of your gentlemen's time, but if you have any other closing remarks you'd like to add, um, you know, let me know and let our audience know. You know, I think this is a really important topic. This needs to be the first of many conversations we have about sustainable seafood, making smart choices, and like Mike said, being curious. I think the more curious you are, the more you'll want to know about what you're eating. You know, people care about the food that's going in their mouths, if it's organic, if it's not organic, if it's GMO, if it's sustainable, if it's all these things. Well, you know what, that pertains to seafood as well. And I think it's a matter of really educating ourselves and educating our families and our friends about what's happening there. And I'm happy to provide as much information as I can on our Google Plus page. Um, I want to thank you both for joining me in our first of a week of Ocean Hangouts, celebrating World Oceans Day, which is this June 8th. And if you have any closing remarks you'd like to share, please do so. Mike, Charles? Okay. Uh, well, I, I would say simply that very few people, uh, depending on geography, but relatively fewer people will, in their lifetimes, go to a functioning rainforest. Um, all people are privileged to go to the sea at some point. And what's happening there uh, is a problem. And people have only realized quite recently that what's going on in the sea is radically unsustainable and that we need to do something about it. And the consumer and the retailers who hold enormous power 
can't do something about it, too. Well, I, I don't know that I can say uh, anything uh, much more well stated than that. But for one, I get to cross off my bucket list appearing in a Google uh, Plus Hangout with Charles Clover. I mean, this is uh, <laughs> quite an amazing thing that technology brings us. But I would say that uh, my one closing um, comment would probably be that um, don't just think about fishing when you're thinking about sustainable seafood. There are many other issues out there. Um, I, I know my organization just thinks about the fishing aspect of this, but there are issues of you know environmental change and environmental degradation and uh, pollution that uh, are really going to be um, noticeably having an impact on a lot of seafood species out there that we depend on. So it, it's not just about the fishing, although it's a very important component, but there are so many issues out there related to the oceans. As Charles said, it's something that touches so many people's lives and they can actually touch um, uh, that start reading a book, start reading some blogs, and start taking pictures and start noticing things for yourself. And I think you'd probably be amazed at what is actually going on out there, like Charles said. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, Charles and Mike, you make both make great points. You know, I, I had no idea how much I needed to care about our beautiful oceans and what's happening in them until I started working for the Taramar Project and educating myself and becoming more curious. And I think it's people like you that need to help drive this message to the masses about why you need to care. And I think this is just a first step. You're correct, Mike, in saying that there's more issues than just fishing and sustainability. There's issues on governmental levels, on pollution, um, you know, plastic pollution, your use of plastic choices you make at the supermarket, um, types of fishing, government regulations, unregulated areas of our world, the lack of marine protected areas. There's so many issues, it's overwhelming. But I think at least from this conversation that we've had today, we can help people become a little bit more curious and take the right first steps into making smart choices for themselves or even just educating themselves about what's out there, whether it's going to one of your websites or even seeing end of the line. And I really, really can't stress enough that I think everybody out there should see this film. It really is incredibly important. And Charles, thank you so much for making a film like this to help educate people about what's going on in our beautiful oceans. I, I really thank you very much for that. So what? I don't help. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just take all the credit. You did it yourself. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but I want to thank you both for your time, and I want to make sure that everybody who's watching us knows how to get in touch with those connected here today. So you can check out um, the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation at the web address here, and you can follow them on Twitter, and you can check out bluemarinefoundation.com, and you can find out more information about Fish to Fork, which gives you content and info about restaurants that provide sustainable seafood in the UK and anything else we discussed here today I will provide on our Google Plus page. So Charles, Mike, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it and um, I look forward to including you in future hangouts. Thank you. Thank you. Take care guys. <laughs>